Hi, I'm Pastor Christian Andrews. I'm pastor at Hope AFLC Church of Enderlin here in Enderlin, North Dakota. This is the first part of a three-part series on membership. We call the membership study, Now I Belong to Jesus. The three parts of the study will talk about our membership in the body of Christ, individually belonging to Jesus and in his church, membership in the local congregation, in this case, Hope AFLC, and then also membership in the Association of Free Lutheran Congregations. Our congregation is a free Lutheran church, a member of this association, and so it's important to understand what the association is also about. We start our study with part one, membership in the body of Christ. We get from the Reformation three truths, three pillars that we can build on, foundational principles that guide our faith and relationship to God. The first of these pillars is the Word alone, the second is grace alone, and the third is faith alone. We have three alones, and yet they work together, each of them individually in their place. Everything that we believe is based on a source that we believe has no errors and is faultless in its authority. We call that source the Bible, or the Word of God. This is the only authority that we have written for us. We believe it is the authority that it is because it is God speaking to us. It is God's Word. The Bible itself speaks of itself that way. One of the places where we find the Bible talking about itself is in a letter to a young pastor named Timothy. The author of that letter was the Apostle Paul, and we believe that the Holy Spirit inspired him to write these words. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So the confession is that all scripture, so we believe that the Bible, all 66 canonical books, of the Old and the New Testament are scripture, and that this scripture, these words, these writings, were inspired by God, or were breathed by God into the authors who wrote them. And furthermore, we believe that the scriptures, God's word to us, has value to how we live. That we can use the word of God to teach what God is like, who God is, what God wants of us, what God wants in a relationship with us, why God wants to be in a relationship with us, what that relationship looks like and what that relationship is about. We can use God's word, the scriptures, for reproof. Now when we have children who disobey us, as, you know, we have rules as parents and things that we want our kids to do, and when our kids disobey us, they need to be reproved. And in the same way, when we violate God's plan for our lives, the scriptures can reprove us. So we tell our children that what they are doing is wrong, what they are doing is not what we've asked them to do, or what we, they're doing uh, is, is not what they're supposed to be doing, and that's called reproof. We can also use God's word for correction. So once we reprove, then we want to be corrected. One of the best things we can do for our children is to give them alternative behaviors. So if they're doing something that they should not be doing, yes, we need to tell them to stop doing that, but we can help them in their maturity if we then tell them what they should do instead or what they could do instead. And so that's correction. And then finally, we use the scriptures for training in righteousness. Righteousness is a gift that God gives to us Righteousness is that quality of being right, of being not guilty. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means as we get into uh, the ideas of grace alone and faith alone. But we need to be trained. And the scriptures then tell us how to live rightly as children of God, as members of Jesus and members of his church. Another verse that we find in scripture where scripture speaks about itself is in a letter that one of Jesus' disciples wrote. This is written by Peter, 
and it's the second of his letters that we have in the Bible, where he writes to us, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. There are some in our world, many perhaps, who suggest to us that the Bible is simply the writings of men bound by their cultures and their ages, bind, bound by the traditions of their cultures. And yet, what we find that Peter writes to us is that uh, the words of Scripture are not men's ideas. These are not simply things that men thought up. They are things that God has given to us. As a matter of fact, he says that the Holy Spirit spoke these words to the authors. And so we believe that as we read the Bible, we are actually reading God's words to us. Matthew uh, quoted Jesus when Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And so we can trust that the words that God has given to us, the words of Jesus and the words of the entire scriptures are the words of God, the words of Jesus, that they are eternal words, that they will not pass away and so that we can trust them because they are his word. On one occasion, as Jesus was teaching, the people uh, felt that his teachings were kind of hard to believe, kind of hard to accept. And many of the people who had been following Jesus left. So Jesus then turned to his disciples and he asked them if they also wanted to leave. One of the disciples, John, wrote this account for us in what we call the Gospel of John. And he says, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So Peter's confession there is one that we also confess. Why is the scripture so important to us? Because it is the scripture that speaks to us the words of eternal life. So our first pillar is that we have as our only authority the word of God, the primary authority, the authority against which we measure everything else, all psychology and sociology and anthropology, uh, all the thoughts of humanity are measured against the scriptures. And the scripture stands as our authority, as the word alone. So then the word alone gives us uh, what God wants to do for us and, what, and how God wants to be in relationship for us. And so our second pillar we call grace alone. We see God's grace in, in all over the Bible, really, not just the New Testament, but throughout the scriptures, we see his grace. But one of the verses where it's perhaps best encapsulated is a very familiar verse, John 3, 16. That verse says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. These are words that came right from Jesus where Jesus is telling us about himself. He is the Son. He is the Son of God who came to us from God because God loves us, because God knows that apart from him and apart from what he does for us and what he did for us through the Son, we will perish. We will be separated from him for all eternity. We call that eternal death. He doesn't want that. God wants us to be with him now and in eternity. He wants us to have eternal life. He loves us enough to provide the solution for our sin. And so he sent Jesus, his son. We read in Romans chapter five, this is one of the letters that the apostle Paul wrote, wrote to a church, to the Christians in the city of Rome. He says, for God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so we have to come face to face with the reality of our sin. We are sinners, and so we sin. We rebel because that is the nature with which we are born. We rebel because we don't want to submit to what God's plan for us is. We don't want Jesus to be our Lord. We want to be our own Lords. And in doing that, we reject the principles, the guidelines, 
we might call them the rules and the commandments that God has given us for a prosperous life. And when we reject those and act against his will, we sin. We reject him in essence, and when we reject him, we are separated from him. We call that spiritual death. And unless we deal with that spiritual death during our lives, then we will be eternally separated from God, and we call that eternal death. But what we read here in Romans chapter 5 is that because God loves us, Christ died for us. You see, the penalty for our sin, what we earn for our sin, is death. That means we have to die. But God doesn't want us to die and be separated from him forever. So Jesus came and died in our place. That is, he took on himself the consequences of our sin so that we would not have to suffer those consequences. He did that because he loved us. He did that while we were still sinners, even though we are sinners. Maybe we could even say because we are sinners. Christ died for us. Another one of the letters that Paul wrote was to the Christians at a city called Ephesus. And there he wrote, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our, in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So that last phrase, by grace you have been saved, is the summary of what God did for us. It's his grace that he uses to show us his great love. And in his great love, even while we were dead in our sin, the Bible calls them trespasses because we cross a boundary line where we are not supposed to cross, we are made alive. We are given life through the forgiveness of sins because of what Christ Jesus did for us. Luke was a doctor who traveled often with the Apostle Paul. He wrote for us the Gospel of Luke, and he also wrote for us uh, the book called the Acts of the Apostles. And often in that book, he quotes from sermons that Peter or Paul or one of the other uh, leaders of the church preached. And these are some words from one of the sermons that he quotes that's found in Acts chapter 15. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. So there's a, we're talking about a couple of different groups of people, probably the Gentiles and the Jews. And the fact is that salvation is for everyone. But again, it's through the grace that God gives to us. Again, going to the letter to the Ephesians, we read, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Our sin makes us slaves to sin. When we sin, we are bound to sin and slaves of sin. So Jesus shed his blood as a payment to redeem us, to buy us out of our slavery to sin and to set us free. He does that by forgiving our sins, and he does that because of the riches of his grace. I love the word lavished. It's just poured out overwhelmingly, overpouring, uh, more than we ever need. He gives us his grace. Again, in the letter to the Ephesians we read, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a, as a result of works, so that no one may boast. So once again, we see God's grace at work in pouring out for us this gift from God. We also see that it's not something that we can earn. There's no, there are no works that we can do. There's no rationing that we can do, no reasoning that we can do. There's nothing that we can do. That's why it says this is not your own doing. We don't deserve 
what God gives to us. We don't deserve his declaration of innocence. We don't deserve to be purchased out of slavery to sin. And yet God, because he is a God of grace, has done that for us and has given us this gift. So the word alone teaches us that our salvation, that our relationship to God is based fully and completely on his grace for us. Not as something we do, but as a gift that he gives to us. That same verse, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, also then shows us the third of our pillars. For again it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. So grace and faith and salvation, this whole package deal, comes to us as a gift from God. Again, going to the letter to the Romans we read, this is in chapter 3, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, and we have read just before that that the law shows us our sin and shows us that we are condemned because of our sin. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So again, we see that word redemption, that he's purchased us out of our slavery to sin. The two other words here are righteousness and justified. They're synonyms, and they are words that come from the court of law. We must stand before God and plead guilty. We are sinners, we sin. We rebel against God's will and plan for us. And when God says to us, how do you plead? We can do nothing but plead guilty. But because of what Jesus has done for us, because he forgives our sins, then the Father says to us, you're not guilty, you're acquitted. Even though we are guilty, he declares us not guilty. And that's what it means that we have his righteousness or that we are justified. But we notice that that justification takes effect in us when we believe it. Again, it says to us that this righteousness that comes to us from God is ours through faith in Jesus Christ and that it is for all who believe. And one of the things that we have to recognize is that we don't have faith in us. By birth, we are separated from God. We are sinners separated from God. We don't have faith, but that God gives us this as a gift. And that when we read his word, the Holy Spirit does a miracle in us and creates faith in us so that we can believe, so that we can trust that these promises that God makes to us are real. Again in Romans, this is at the end of chapter six, we read, for the wages of sin is death. So again, what we do uh, is earn death. We earn separation from God because we rebel against God. But, he says, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we are simply called to believe and accept that this is true. John wrote to us in his gospel in chapter 14, these words of Jesus, where Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Our relationship with Jesus is an exclusive relationship. It's based on the faith that he gives to us, and the content and focus of that faith is Jesus. If we have faith in anything else, then these promises aren't true for us, because Jesus says that this is exclusive. He says, I am the way. So he is the only way that we can get to the Father in heaven. He says, I am the truth. So he is the only truth that can lead us to life with the Father in heaven. He says, I am the life. So the only way that we can have life is by having the life who is Jesus. Again, in the letter to the Romans, this is in chapter 10, we read, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
confessing in our mouth is what we believe in our hearts. We say what we believe. What comes out of our mouths is what is in our hearts. And so when we surrender our wills, when we surrender our rebellion to God and welcome Jesus as Lord over our lives, because of what he's done with us, which is what we believe, that God raised him from the dead, then the promise is that we will be saved. Now, when we say that God raised Jesus from the dead, we have to ask, well, why was Jesus dead? Well, because he died. And why did he die? He died the death that we deserve to take our place in the consequences for our sin. So when we say that we believe that God raised him from the dead, we're agreeing and believing and accepting and trusting that that death was for me and that that resurrection was for me to prove that Jesus has the power and the authority to forgive sins and to give life. The disciple John also wrote some other books in the Bible. He wrote three letter, little letters and he also wrote what we call the Revelation of John. In the first of his little letters, at the end of that little letter, in what we call chapter 5, he wrote, And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. This is the truth that we can believe. This is the truth that we can trust. This is what faith is about. And accepting Jesus into our lives. And accepting Jesus into us. It says, whoever has the Son has life. So if we have Jesus, if we have the Son in us, living in us, then we have life. As John also wrote in his Revelation, this is in chapter 3, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. Now, eating was something very special in first century Palestine. You didn't eat just with anybody. Oh, Jesus ate with a lot of people because he was building relationships with them. So when he says that he wants to come in to us and eat with us, what he's saying is that he wants to be in an intimate relationship with us. We talk about him living in our hearts or being on the thrones of our lives. Well, he is knocking on that door of our heart, our heart being the core of who we are, asking us to open the door and let him in. Again, in John's Gospel we read, But to all who did receive him, who believed on his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This is what we call the new birth. When we receive Jesus, when we believe in him and what he has done for us, we become God's children and we are born again. Now, I'm hoping that as you're listening to this, you have recognized that you do believe that Jesus is Lord and that uh, you believe that God raised him from the dead and you can make that a confession. But if you don't and you want to, if you want to have the assurance that your sins are forgiven and that you have Christ now and you will spend eternity after this life ends with our Father God in heaven, I have a prayer that you can pray with me. Dear Jesus, I recognize that I am a sinner in need of forgiveness. I believe in you and in your death and resurrection for the forgiveness of my sins. Save me and give me the assurance of salvation because I confess that you are Lord and believe that God raised you from the dead. Amen. If you just prayed this prayer sincerely or if you've ever prayed it or one like it, you can know for sure that you belong to Jesus, that you are his, that you are a member of his family and his body, the church.